So, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Antonio Barrios, and I'm currently working towards my PhD at Barcelona Tech in Spain under the supervision of Professor Casas. And today I'm mostly talking about uh, the uh, applications that we did in our research group back in Barcelona using uh, optical backscatter photometry or OBR based distributed optical fiber sensors. And I, I must say that I'm actually in the end of my first year and most of the work that I'm going to present was done uh, before I arrived to Barcelona, so bear with me as I try to properly present these, these applications. So just a quick overview of my presentation. First, I will uh, introduce briefly the role of fiber optic sensors on SHM. Then I will specifically uh, speak about the distributed form of these fiber sensors. Then I will uh, showcase all the applications that we did using these types of sensors back in Barcelona. And then I will conclude uh, with some remarks about our, our examples and applications. So in a simple way, uh, fiber optic sensors present a lot of advantages when compared uh, with the use of more traditional and electric sensors. Uh, some of them are represented here, uh, but I, I, I want to pinpoint, for instance, the fact that they are immune from electromagnetic interferences, so they allow us to obtain very f uh, noise-free data, and also that they are very small and lightweight, so they are very easy to uh, install and operate. And there are several different ways of uh, categorizing fiber optic sensors, but in the, for the purpose of this presentation, we decided to sort them out on these three different cat categories, grading-based sensors, interferometric sensors, and the distributed sensors. So the distributed sensors are the ones that I'm going to speak about here. And this happens, we, we think this uh, is a, they are a very good uh, type of sensor because uh, for the additionally to the advantages that I showcase on the previous slide, here, uh, an adv additional advantage is the fact that virtually every cross-section of the structural uh, element that is being monitored is being monitored. So all the possible damage that's going to occur, uh, in this case cracks, are going to be covered by the sensor and otherwise that would be not possible with the use of discrete or point sensors. Another additional advantage is uh, when monitoring structural elements, specifically for large uh, structures, the number of sensors uh, can rapidly increase and with it the number of uh, required connections. And with the use of DOFs of the distributed optical fiber sensors, we can uh, use just one uh, uh, optical fiber, one sensor, and with it only one connection cable, uh, making the, all the monitoring system more easily uh, done. So these sensors work by the uh, interaction between the light source and the, the optical uh, sensor. That this, this phenomenon is called scattering, and it occurs in all directions, but it's the backscattering that we are mostly interested about. This backscattering provides three components, and these three components are the Rayleigh component, the brilliant component and the Raman component. Um, there are different ways of using these uh, components for to obtain the changes in the structural element that we want. In the time do domain, we have BOTDR and the BOTDA that they are being the most used and success successful techniques applied, both based on the brilliant component, and they are characterized by providing long-range sensing and, oh, but however, they present a very uh, low spatial resolution around one meter, which is insufficient for crack detection or damage detection. On the other hand, we have in the frequency domain the optical backscatter of based uh, on the, the Rayleigh based of OFDR that uh, uses the Rayleigh component through the use of this swept wavelength interferometry that provides us a, a very high spatial resolution, a spatial resolution as high as one millimeter for the reading of strain and temperature. And this technique is characterized uh, by having a short range uh, sensing, but providing a very high special resolution that's good for uh, damage detection. And this, this, I forgot to mention, this was a technique that we used in all our applications that I'm going to, to showcase now. So this was the first application that we did back in our laboratory in Barcelona. This was done in 2009. So the, the main goal here was to assess and, and study how the, the, the sensor was going to perform when used on this concrete slab and also to see if it was able to, with the use of this monitoring system, to detect and locate the, the, the appearance of cracks on these structures. So 
uh, four different stretches of distributed optical fiber sensors were implemented here, two on the top side slab and two on the bottom side slab. Here we can see some pictures of this experiment. This was a, a small slab, 5.6 meters long, 1.6 meters wide, with a thickness of 0 0.285, a simple supported uh, slab, and the load was implied with the use of this MTS actuator in the middle of the, the span. So we obtained these, these graphs, these results, where we can see the strain uh, plotted uh, against the, the length of the, the fiber for the different stretches. We analyzed each stretch uh, uh, separately. Uh, here we obtained the ultimate load uh, of the slab of 255.15 kilonewtons. And as you can see, we were able to obtain continuous records for different load levels, continuous not only in time, but also in space. And as you can see, uh, the, the peaks that we obtained with the, these graphs, they, were a very, they present a very good correlation with the visually observed cracks that were appearing on the slab. So we were able to uh, not only to detect, but localize the cracks that were appearing in the, in the slab uh, with the use of these sensors. And you can also observe that even for high load levels, the fiber was performing very well and uh, without breaking. And afterwards, this was more recently, there was uh, an algorithm that was developed in order to try to quantify the damage. So for these, we tried to calculate the average crack width in specific zones. With, uh, we used the area of the, the strain that we obtained using the OBR sensor. Uh, by equalizing these two expressions, we were able to solve it by the sum of the total uh, width of the cracks. And then dividing by the total number of cracks, we were able to obtain this average crack width. And as you can see here, comparing the, with the electrical sensors, we, we have a very good agreement with the stretches that we have with our OBR sensors and the means of these uh, electrical sensors, which is very encouraging and validates the use of this algorithm. More recently, we tried to apply the same sensor for the monitoring and the, the detection of the shear crack pattern on uh, partially pre-stressed concrete beams or PPC beams. Uh, this was, was done in conjunction with another uh, group in our uh, university. Partially pre-stressed concrete beams especially, they are designed to allow the crack under surface loading. So the use of uh, monitoring systems for the control of cracking is especially important in this case. And the, the beam was divided into a um, bending test span and the shear test span. We only instrumented the shear test span and that's what I'm going to speak about here. So we proposed uh, this grid to monitor the crack, the crack propagation formation in these, in these beams. We proposed two different beams. The beam I1 where we used two different optical fibers. One that was concentrated in measuring longitudinal strains and the second one for vertical strains. On the second one, in beam I2, we just used one longer cable uh, that will conform the similar 2D grid for the detection of this uh, crack propagation. Here we see an image of beam I2 with the, the cable glued to the surface of the, of the beam. And here on the right, we, also, we can see that we also used a strain rosette with LVDTs for the monitoring for comparison purposes with the results of the OBR sensor. So we analyzed each stretch separately. And after uh, the t analyzing each uh, stretch, we were able and converting all the, the stretches for a, a local coordinate system that corresponded with our 2D grid. We were able to, to form these 2D graphs that, that have the uh, maps of the shear crack propagation and formation. And as you can see, they, they provide a very good agreement with the visually observed ones with photographic evidence. In the same way that we did with the concrete slab, we also uh, tried to apply this algorithm in a different, we had to do some uh, uh, different ways here to calculate the shear crack width and average crack width. I'm not going to, into a lot of detail here. This is part of the work of my colleague, Gerardo Rodriguez, who's finishing his PhD. So in the end, I have the references. And if you want, you can look up and see more about this. Again, comparing with uh, the more traditional sensors with the LVDTs, we see a very good agreement with the obtained calculated crack width with the OBR and the one obtained with the, the other sensors. Now, going to real world applications, this was the first 
application that we had on a real world structure in this viaduct on a highway uh, near Barcelona in Spain. It's a 125 meter long bridge that has a, a deck with 14 meters wide uh, with pre-stressed pre -stressed box beams over five spans that are supported in uh, double piles. And here we used three different uh, optical fibers, two 25 meter long fibers uh, allocated longitudinally to the, to the structure and another one 50 meter uh, long cable that was uh, allocated perpendicular, transversal to the, to the structure in three different cross sections. And here the, 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 the test was divided between two parts. The first one was a moving load track of 400 kilonewtons that was passing the second one on, a, on the, the track being uh, stopped on the middle of the, of the bridge with the normal uh, passing of vehicles. And the main goal was to assess and study the feasibility of the use of these sensors on a real world structure and also to compare with other used sensors that were uh, uh, allocated in the structure in, or for initial load tests. So here we can see, for example, in the first part of the test, the, the obtained strain data um, on fiber FO2, the one that was allocated longitudinally. Here we can see when the, tra the track was uh, going in a one quarter of the span, we had this distributor of strain. Then after the test was completed and the removing of the track, we obtained these horizontal uh, strain that was more or less as we expected. On the second part, as I said, the track was stopped in the middle of the span and, the, and there was the normal traffic passing by the, the bridge. And here we can see after 10 minutes after stabilizing the, the system, we obtained this distribution of strain uh, as we expected with the higher strain in the middle span. So afterwards, we tried to calculate the displacement and we were able to calculate the displacement of 3.45 millimeters deflection at mid-span with the OBR data. And comparing with the experimental obtained one of 3.71 millimeters, we concluded that it presents a very good agreement. Another bridge that was monitored, it was more recently last year in, in Barcelona, this Sarajevo viaduct. It, this, one, this viaduct is located in one of the main entrances of Barcelona, so there's a lot of traffic passing underby. Here, the, the bridge authorities decided to enlarge the deck. Uh, so during this process, they, they asked us to, you, to allocate these distributed optical fiber sensors inside the, the, the beams. So we used two different uh, optical fibers, DOF1 and DOF2, that are uh, showcased here. And this process was done through several months, from June last year until more or less February of this year. And as you can see, you can see an evolution of the strains for the, for the different measurements. And what, what, which was most, most important was the fact that we could obtain the stress increases and variations with the use of these sensors. And we were able to conclude that there were not uh, induced changes of structural, uh, to the structural behavior that were significant. So they, the, the use of these sensors allowed us to uh, uh, assess the, the safety of this uh, process. Also, uh, this concrete cooling tower in the north of Spain, in near Barcelona, was also instrumented with the use of OBR sensors. Here, two main vertical cracks had appeared, so uh, we decided to uh, use the, the sensors to observe the, behavior, the behavior before and after crack repair. And uh, before, this is a 120 meter high structure. So before allocating the, the sensors, there, there was a 3D finite element model that was developed in order to uh, try to help us decide which, where we should uh, put the, the sensors and it was here in the middle next to the, the, the main area of the cracks. So this is uh, one of the examples of the, the strain readings that we got from the outside surface tower. Here we can see from the inside surface tower. I just would like to pinpoint here that we can see different types of peaks and we should be very careful because the, the concrete presents some roughness that should be taken care in account when analyzing these data. For example, these small peaks, they represent that roughness of the concrete and should not be taken account into cracks. I'll, I'll, uh, on the other side, these higher peaks that they are dynamic and they, they change with the, the time, they, they are representative of the cracks and the damage formation in this structure. 
uh, in the same way that I, that I said about the previous bri the bridge in, uh, in the, above the highway, we also perform uh, an integration and obtain the deflection at mid-span using the OBR data, and it was able to, to see that it agreed very well with the 3D finite element model uh, and with the uh, other electrical sensors. So the use of this sensor allowed for the increase of the lifetime of this cooling tower. And finally, uh, this historical monument in Barcelona, this UNESCO World Heritage Site, uh, was also a target of our application for the OBR sensor by our group. Here, there was some kind of cause of concern because two columns um, presented some serious cracking. So they were, it was decided to replace those two columns. So we allocated this, the fiber sensors on the top of the, of the, the floor during the, the removal and replacement of these columns. Here you can see where we allocated the optical fiber sensor. And with it, we obtained these type of measurements for the first column was replaced on the 1st of February. That's why we have three measurements here. Uh, here, it's the old data. So in order to be more clear, uh, more cl uh, we should zoom the information here for a 10 centimeter length. And here you can see with more precision what was ha happening. We see that during the first, the first reading that is a calibration, it's around 20 micro strains. And then with the, the replacement of the first column, there was an increase of strain of between 20 and 14 uh, micro strains. And uh, the highest strain that was achieved was 100. But since we have to subtract the initial calibration, we would say that the maximum uh, increase of strain was of 80 micro strain. Then we can see that for the last reading, the structure is indeed uh, regaining stiffness. So it's, it's as we, uh, we were expecting. So I'm reaching my conclusions. and. With uh, these examples, we saw that the OBR sensor is a very promising technology for SHM, since it allows for a um, continuous, not, in, not only in time, but also in Spain, in space of strain and temperature uh, measurements. Uh, with these experiments, the, the main objectives were to assess the performance of these sensors, both in laboratory and real world co conditions. We saw, with these examples, a very good performance of this technique since it, it showed a very good agreement and good correlation with the use of other conventional sensors. Uh, one thing that we also concluded is that the, fact, the use of a correct bonding agent and the smoothing of the concrete surface before applying the sensor is very important in these types of applications. Uh, also that the OBR sensors, they, they present a very uh, good performance uh, for either low and even low levels of low levels or low levels close to the to the failure of concrete. And finally, since this is a, a workshop that tries to quantify the value of uh, SHM, uh, the economic impact of, the, of these sensors, although they present a very high initial investment, especially on the acquisition system, we think that the, they present a very uh, important economical saving when comparing with other monitoring techniques, since the, uh, there's no other technique that uh, is able to provide the same information with uh, the same number of monitored points. So here are the references if you want to look further up about these uh, applications. And thank you very much. If you have any question, please feel free.